Thank you. That concludes general questions. We're going to turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one from Jackson Carlow. Uh, presiding officer, in the continuing spirit of asking questions that aim to inform, uh, can I in the first instance seek further clarification from the First Minister on the issue of testing? MSPs have been approached by community pharmacists serving customers with flu-like symptoms, and they are often the first point of contact for the elderly, but will not themselves know if they have the virus. And we've been contacted by doctors who are at home with what they think is probably just a cold, but without a test, they cannot be sure. Now, clearly, the government's objective is to expand testing capacity, but can the First Minister confirm where within that expansion she believes those in frontline service roles should be prioritised? First Minister. Uh, can I thank Jackson Carlow for his uh, question? Before I uh, turn to the issue of testing, can I take the opportunity to advise Parliament that as of 9 o'clock this morning, there have been a total of 266 positive cases confirmed. That is an increase of 39 from yesterday. Um, I would stress, of course, as I have done previously, that that is likely to be an underestimate of the true prevalence of the infection across our society. I'm also extremely sad to confirm that as at nine o'clock this morning, there have now been six reported deaths of patients in Scotland who had tested positive for COVID-19. That's an increase of three from yesterday. And I want to put on record uh, my thoughts uh, to their loved ones at this incredibly painful time for them. Turning to the issue of testing, and uh, can I say to Jackson Carlow that frontline uh, workers, critical uh, and key workers, particularly in the NHS and social care, are a priority for our expanded testing services. Uh, broadly speaking, there are three objectives uh, that we are seeking to meet with testing uh, right now. Firstly, to protect those who are most vulnerable and save lives. That is uh, why those who are admitted to hospital with COVID-19 symptoms or with uh, upper respiratory infection will be tested. Secondly, allowing critical workers to be at work unless they are actually ill. Um, and there is work ongoing in all four nations to define that list of critical workers, but of course it includes uh, those at the front line of our NHS and social care services. And thirdly, uh, the objective of surveillance to make sure that we are able to monitor the prevalence of the infection uh, across the population. Um, right now we have three labs, uh, Edinburgh, Glasgow and Dundee that are operational. They currently have the capacity to do around 780 tests per day between them. Uh, we are currently working to expand capacity initially uh, to enable up to 3,000 tests to be done uh, every day and that work is underway. Um, in the longer term, um, but hopefully not too much longer, and this is work that has been led by the UK government right now, we hope that there will be the availability of new forms of testing, uh, dipstick tests rather than swab tests, which will allow people to test themselves much more quickly and tell whether or not they've had the virus. These are not available right now, but I do hope we will be able to see that kind of expansion of testing as soon as possible. Jackson Carlo. Uh, can, can I thank the First Minister for that? I think that gives a helpful clarification. And in this shared endeavour, as we all confront this emergency, the thoughts of us all will be with uh, others who are suffering bereavement as a result of it, uh, following the First Minister's confirmation of the additional uh, lives lost. Uh, turning to the broader economy, I acknowledge that the Chancellor has stated that everything already announced constitutes but the first steps of many, and that there is a pressing need for further detailed assistance targeted in support of individuals. However, on Tuesday, the UK government unveiled a package of financial measures to support business. Scottish businesses face the toughest of times, but we know can, will and must bounce back and prosper with the right help and support. Now, the Chancellor Rishi Sunak has backed business with more than £330 billion. Can the First Minister update us on how the Scottish Government will help Scottish business through the weeks and months ahead? And in particular, in response to the many inquiries MSPs are receiving, can the First Minister confirm it to those who recognise the clear advantage of the assistance being offered to their businesses uh, that it will be kept simple and how they should expect to access it? First Minister. Uh, well, obviously, and this is a statement of the obvious, this is an incredibly difficult time for businesses across our economy, but also an incredibly difficult time for the workers uh, who staff our businesses. Um, I have welcomed, as has the Economy Secretary, the support outlined by the Chancellor earlier this week. Uh, we have confirmed and will continue to ensure that every single penny of funding that comes to Scotland 
to support businesses is passed on to businesses in Scotland. And uh, the Economy Secretary has already set out some of the initial detail of that. So, for example, all small businesses receiving the Small Business Bonus Scheme or Rural Relief will be eligible for a £10,000 grant. We will provide 12 months relief for properties in hospitality, leisure and retail and a £25,000 grant for hospitality, leisure and retail properties if they have a rateable value between £18,000 and £51,000. On top of that, we've taken steps to effectively halt the inflationary increase in business rates, which was due in April. Taken together, this is a £2.2 billion package of support to help sustain businesses and, crucially, help them pay their staff and treat uh, their staff fairly. Uh, as Jackson, Jackson Carlow says, this is initial support. It is inevitably the case that further support will be required and we continue to discuss that uh, constructively with the UK government. Um, as briefly as I can, presiding officer, on the point about how businesses access this support, which is very important, we want to make it as simple as possible. Uh, but given the different kinds of support that we have announced, we're approaching this in three different ways, and I'll very briefly uh, summarise those. Uh, the universal rates relief available for all properties, we're working to make sure that that is available automatically. Uh, businesses will not have to apply for that. The 100% uh, rates relief for retail, hospitality and leisure, uh, that will require some form of application from the sectors involved, but we're working with COSLA and local authority finance directors and how that can be administered in the most straightforward way possible. Uh, and in the meantime, we'll bring forward legislation next week to enshrine this relief from the 1st of April. Uh, things are slightly more complicated when it comes to grant schemes. We've set out two uh, grant schemes, the £10,000 small business grants and the £25,000 ones to retail, hospitality and uh, leisure. Um, we are in discussion with COSA right now and with councils and business associations about how these can be efficiently uh, distributed the same challenges I know are being faced in England with their grant schemes. There's no simple answer here, but we do want to do this as straightforwardly and as quickly as possible, and I will undertake to make sure that information and guidance is distributed to MSPs and indeed to business organisations as soon as we have the, the detail clarified. Thank you. Jackson Carla. That's all very helpful. Uh, that clarification, I think, will be much valued by uh, business, and obviously we will lend our support to any legislation required uh, to give it effect. One sector that is facing an uncertain future is childcare. Uh, John Swinney will this afternoon be expanding the First Minister's confirmation yesterday, uh, together with Gavin Williamson, that across the UK, schools and nurseries, including private nurseries, will close from tomorrow. The medical advice is clear and we must keep people safe. And we also know that childcare is vital to keeping the UK working through coronavirus and once we have beaten this virus, to returning to prosperity. Now, I think we all fully appreciate that closure is unavoidable. But could the First Minister tell us what help we can give to this vital sector? First Minister. Well, Jackson Callow is absolutely right to highlight the importance of the childcare sector uh, for uh, the business reasons that he set out for the care of uh, young children right now, but also, of course, for the future when we are on the other side of this virus, when we uh, obviously have those ambitious plans to uh, double the provision of early learning, uh, early years uh, childcare and childcare. Uh, so, we want to work to mitigate the impact as far as possible, although I have to be uh, straight with people, we will not be able to do that completely. Uh, John Swinney will set out more details of this, uh, amongst other things, in his statement this afternoon, but I want today to take the opportunity to confirm to Parliament that we have decided uh, as government to guarantee the funding that private and third sector nurseries currently receive from uh, the Scottish Budget. That funding, of course, pays for the statutory entitlement that children receive right now in those nurseries and across the private and third sectors, uh, and that is funding worth around £220 million. We will keep that cash in place even while children are at home and not at nurseries so that we can help uh, support businesses through what is a very difficult time. This will be in addition to the work that we will do with councils to uh, maximise the use of private and third sector nurseries to provide childcare to key workers who need it. And there will be more detail on that when John Swinney makes his statement later. Jackson Carla. Again, that confirmation of funding will be hugely welcomed uh, by the sector. Uh, key workers will be crucial in the battle uh, with the virus. And obviously, defining key workers is in itself something which needs to be clarified and is not as straightforward as it at first seems. Because however desirable, if everyone becomes a key worker, then we're right back where we started. Now, yesterday, the First Minister mentioned nurses, doctors and other critical staff. Can she confirm that this will include police officers? And can she tell us which other groups will or may be part of the key worker plan? 
And finally, will the First Minister join me in asking people to be patient as information is confirmed and made available? These are evolving responses to a national emergency, and it's unreasonable to expect every T to be crossed and every I to be dotted on the detail with immediate effect. The public should know that both of Scotland's governments are working to ensure as much clarity as possible, as quickly as possible, and we should all support those working flat out to achieve this. First Minister. Well, I, I absolutely echo uh, those comments. Uh, on the issue of key workers, this is, is difficult and not straightforward territory, and we've got to get the balance right. Jackson Carlow asked me uh, directly about police officers, and yes, absolutely, I uh, would expect that police officers uh, would uh, be included. In fact, I think it's inconceivable that police officers will not be included. Indeed, I would fully expect all of the emergency services will be part of the definition. Uh, beyond that, there is work ongoing uh, across all four nations to try to come to the right definition. Uh, I would make a couple of points there. One uh, is the obvious point that Jackson Carlow has already made. Uh, if we go too far, we will undermine the public health reasons uh, for regretfully having to close schools uh, if we end up having too many children in our schools. Uh, that's the first point. Uh, the second point, while we will try to get as much national consistency around this as possible, it undoubtedly will be the case that some local flexibility will be required. What uh, might be considered a, a key and critical worker in a, a remote rural or island community may not be exactly the same as that definition in the centre of Glasgow or Edinburgh. So I think it's important that we have that flexibility. Uh, so I uh, understandably uh, want to say that the focus is very much on those who are required to keep our health and social care services running to cope with the uh, COVID-19 crisis. Beyond that, there are some uh, obvious areas, uh, energy sector, for example, to make sure we can continue to uh, heat our homes and keep the lights on. Uh, those who are required to get food to different parts of our country. So that work is ongoing. We will continue to update Parliament on that uh, as, as that definition becomes clearer. Um, and, and just to end uh, with Jackson Carlow's final point, which uh, I agreed with at the start of this answer, um, I, and I will do so again, I've given an assurance to people across the country that the Scottish Government will be as open and transparent on an ongoing basis as possible. Um, I've never been as acutely aware right now of the inability of government alone to deal with this challenge. I, as First Minister, will do my best to lead uh, this operation in the months ahead, but I need the help of everybody across Scotland. So what I can do is share as much information as possible. But sometimes that will involve being frank about where I don't know the answer to something immediately or have to be honest that certain things take some time to be put in place. John Swinney, as an example of this, will give as much detail as possible about the alternative arrangements we're putting in place in light of school closures. But again, to be frank, that planning work will continue over the days to come. Uh, this has to be a collective national endeavour. It will not be easy, but if we do that, all of us pulling together, government, the public, all parts of the economy and the public sector, then I, I do have confidence, notwithstanding how incredibly difficult and challenging this situation is, that the country will uh, be able to get through it. Thank you. Question two, Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, and I want, first of all, to pay tribute to all our social care and NHS staff who are working tirelessly under, under some of the most challenging conditions we have ever faced. Uh, and I'm sure I can speak for all of us when I say that they have our unwavering support and our unconditional backing. The First Minister is well aware that there is real and growing concern that two-thirds of frontline Scottish ambulance service crews do not yet have the personal protective equipment that they need. So can the First Minister tell us when they will get the safety equipment that they need and that they have been promised? First Minister. Uh, that, that work is underway at pace as we speak. The Health Secretary is meeting this afternoon with the Scottish Ambulance Service and the GMB, the, the trade union uh, associated with the Scottish Ambulance Service, to make sure that the concerns that frontline workers have are being properly and quickly addressed. And I give an undertaking here today that we will do everything possible to ensure that is the case. Health Protection Scotland uh, has issued clear guidance on the types of protective equipment that is required in different circumstances. We have made supplies available. There are pressures on these supplies, not just in Scotland, but globally uh, right now, but we must do everything we can to support those on the front line. Um, we always owe our frontline uh, health and social care workforce an enormous debt of gratitude, but um, 
I, I can say candidly, we will never, ever owe them more than we will do in the weeks and months to come. Uh, my job as First Minister with the Health Secretary is to make sure that we do everything we can to support them, and that is a responsibility uh, I treat with the utmost seriousness. Richard Leonard. Can I thank the First Minister for that answer? More supplies of PPE were delivered to ambulance stations across Scotland just yesterday afternoon but they weren't the full face protection FFP3 masks which are needed. It was another batch of paper surgical masks with expiry dates of April 2016. When we raised the concern on Tuesday that this same batch of masks had been supplied to GPs, the Cabinet Secretary said that she was aware of the issue and was taking steps to ensure resupply and that the situation is not repeated. Regrettably, it has been re repeated. We all know that we really can't afford to put our frontline NHS staff, our key workers, at increased unnecessary and avoidable risk. So what guarantee can the First Minister give that the appropriate supplies will be made available? And what advice can she give to workers like those in the Scottish Ambulance Service who believe that they have been put at risk? First Minister. Uh, we will do everything we can to protect those on the front line. In terms of the type of protective equipment that is required by different categories of health workers, uh, Health Protection Scotland has issued guidance. In a service like the Scottish Ambulance Service, there will be a mix of masks uh, required. Some will be the ones uh, described by Richard Leonard. Uh, some other uh, parts of the workforce will require other types of masks. It's not for me or the Health Secretary as politicians to say what is required. It is for Health Protection Scotland uh, to do so. And we will continue to work, as we have done with GPs uh, and with the Ambulance Service, to make sure that those supplies are there. I will say uh, again, uh, and I... I think it is important to understand this, that just as is the case with ventilators, uh, with supply of this kind of equipment, there is uh, a global demand for this right now, and these supplies are under pressure, which is why one of the other things we are seeking to do is look at how uh, we get alternative supplies of these. In terms of the issue uh, with uh, the expiry dates, that is something the Health Secretary is uh, has and will continue to consider. There will be some circumstances where, again, by experts, not by politicians, uh, supplies of things will be revalidated for use because it will be judged that notwithstanding that, they are still safe to use. Uh, but the priority in all of these decisions will be the safety and the security of those uh, who are looking after us. That is something everybody has got a right to expect from government, but I'm sure Richard Leonard will understand, and I am uh, conscious of this in every decision I take, um, on the response to this is that I need to make sure that my decisions are being informed by the best expert advice and that's what I will undertake to do. Richard Leonard. Uh, can I again thank the First Minister uh, for that answer. The Cabinet Secretary for Health has confirmed that no matter what precautions are taken, rising absence rates are expected during the next few weeks of the outbreak. Absence rates of between 25 and 30 per cent of the NHS workforce at any one time. And it's because of this that medics, nurses, paramedics and other health professionals are calling for the testing of key workers as swiftly as possible. They don't want to spread the virus if they have it, but they also want to be able to continue to work to support their colleagues and provide essential care for patients if all they have is a cold or if they are no longer contagious. I fully appreciate that the First Minister again today has committed to expanding testing. But is she, able, is she able to tell us what the timetable for this is, how frequently she expects frontline testing to take place, and if the possibility of self-testing has been explored, when is that likely to be widely available to key workers in Scotland? First Minister. Well, on the issue of when new and different kinds of tests are likely to be available. I, I cannot answer that question. This is one of the things where I've, I've got to be honest. This is a global issue. There are uh, discussions uh, happening in the UK with pharmaceutical companies about the provision of new and quicker types of tests. 
I hope that is very soon. It's in all of our interest to see that. But Richard Leonard will understand the, the processes uh, that uh, require to be gone through to produce new kinds of uh, approaches like that. Um, on the issue of, of testing more generally, I've set out, uh, firstly, that it is absolutely our commitment that key and critical workers will be tested. That is in the interest of all of us that that happens because we want, uh, wherever possible, those who care for us to be at their work and we want them to be as safe as possible. Uh, there will be a, a need to be guided by expert opinion as to how often key and critical workers require uh, to be tested, just as there is the ongoing work I've already spoken about to make sure we are properly defining uh, that list of, of who uh, is categorised as a key and critical worker, but obviously that includes those in the front line of our NHS and social care services. In terms of timescales, we are working at pace. Uh, there are uh, large numbers of people uh, quite literally working around the clock uh, on this. That includes the Scottish Government, but uh, that is the least of it. Uh, people across our uh, emergency services, our health and social care services in particular, uh, to do all of this as quickly as possible. So the work that I have already talked about in terms of expanding our testing capacity, that has already been expanded at an earlier stage uh, of this outbreak when we brought uh, the laboratory in Dundee uh, on stream. We are now working to expand it beyond that to make sure we are using all possible capacity that we've got. We're working hard to make sure as quickly as possible there's an understanding of what workers are being tested and how that is to happen. So these things are happening at pace uh, and I would, I guess, go back to Jackson Carlaw's point. I, I, nobody or few people, that's not true, everybody understands the seriousness of this, but I, I would say to Richard Leonard, uh, to take some assurance from, uh, I absolutely understand the urgency of all of these issues uh, and want to make sure that all of these things are put in place as quickly as possible and will continue to do everything I can um, as head of the Scottish Government to make sure that we are taking all the steps to ensure that that is the case. Thank you. I intend to take some further supplementaries, but after the party leaders. Uh, Patrick Harvey. Question three. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The current crisis is an unprecedented challenge for every level of government. It's a challenge for all of us to work together as never before, and it's also a challenge for our whole society to show that the values of compassion, solidarity, and mutual care are what matters at a time like this. So I want to join with others in expressing our thanks and concern for the dedicated people working in our NHS and other public services and also for those people who've been undervalued for a long time. Every carer, cleaner, supermarket worker, and many more, their work is essential to help us all get through this, and they need our support. Like other members, I've heard from many people who just want to help, whether that's keeping in touch with family, looking out for a neighbour, or making sure that people in isolation in their community have got what they need. As social distancing measures become ever more important, this kind of voluntary community help may become more difficult. How can the government and MSPs make sure that people know how to help one another and to do so safely in the weeks ahead? First Minister. Well, can I thank Patrick Harvey for that question? And can I agree with this sentiment? I think we are learning a really hard lesson right now about the fragility of modern life in the modern world and all that we have come to take for granted, whether that's hugging a loved one, meeting friends for a coffee, jumping on a plane to go on holiday, but perhaps at the same time, we're also being reminded of what and who really matters in life, uh, reminded of the importance of good health, of love and friendship and solidarity, and the importance of looking out for each other. And I think uh, in these difficult and dark times, and uh, there is no doubt that uh, they are difficult and dark, we should hold on to these values uh, that have, are perhaps coming to the fore. I've heard so many heartwarming and inspiring stories of communities not waiting to be told or, or asked, but just getting on with it and looking out for uh, others and, and thinking about how they can play a part in the challenge that we all face. Uh, and a lot of that is happening in probably in every corner of Scotland, what we as government are thinking very hard uh, is a, about how we support that and facilitate that and, you know, give the, even if it's financial support or other support, how we do that. That's why part of Aileen Campbell's statement yesterday was the provision of funding to help with those voluntary efforts. And we'll provide further information to MSPs for wider uh, dissemination about how local groups can access that because that is going to be really important. I visited Age Scotland yesterday morning uh, with help from government. They are expanding their existing helplines so that more older people 
have somebody to phone if they need advice or help, or if they just need to hear a friendly voice. And there are going to be examples of that all over the country. And we all need to do uh, our part and play our part in supporting that as well as we can. Patrick Harvey. I'm grateful for the answer. And I, I hope the government knows that the whole chamber uh, will offer support for, for these actions. One group in our society, though, that is most urgently in need of help uh, will be those who are losing their incomes but who are still facing continued rent demands. I've heard from one constituent who's already seen her full-time income disappear completely. Her boss wants to be kind, but an events company with no events to run simply cannot pay her. She's got no idea how she's going to pay her rent or other bills. I've heard of some landlords who are being responsible and recognising people's needs, but also I've heard from people who are being forced out of their homes or threatened with that, using a range of existing grounds for eviction, not just rent arrears. The Scottish Government's announcement yesterday will still leave people facing a choice between the threat of losing their home at this dangerous time or building up unpayable debts over the coming, month, coming months, while in many cases their landlords are benefiting from a mortgage holiday. Isn't it clear that we need a complete ban on evictions during this crisis on any grounds and a rent holiday for those who need it? First Minister. Uh, well, we will continue to look at the action we can take and need to take. And I, I rule nothing out um, and want to rule as much in as possible. But let me say today, categorically, uh, as First Minister, that nobody should face eviction from their home uh, because of rent arrears accrued as a result of the coronavirus yeah. crisis. And I hope everybody across the chamber agrees with that. And let me, <laughs> let me set out the action that Aileen Campbell announced yesterday, although it is not necessarily the end of the road, we are continuing to look at what more we can do. Um, to put it in context, and I, I'm not, I should say I'm, I'm not trying to be political or criticise the UK government here, that is not the intention, I'm just trying to give some context for what I'm saying. The, the Prime Minister set out yesterday emergency legislation uh, so that landlords won't be able to start proceedings to evict tenants for uh, at least a three-month period. Uh, we don't need to do that because that is what our current law says. Uh, that's why uh, Aileen Campbell set out that we're going to extend that period uh, to six months, so extend the existing provision. Uh, housing tribunals, uh, in any event, are not sitting right now, so no proceedings would be taken forward at this time uh, anyway. But let me repeat, nobody should face eviction because of this crisis we're living through. What I've just described there uh, applies to landlords in the private rented sector. Uh, let me just for completeness say that I would, uh, and the government will take action if we find that any social landlord was contemplating raising eviction proceedings against anybody um, in these circumstances. And in my... I should, I should complete that point and say, in my experience, certainly in my constituency experience, where we have outstanding social landlords, I would not expect that any of them would do that. Uh, so the government will continue to make sure uh, that if there are issues arise here that put uh, people in an unfair position, we will not hesitate to take the action that is required. Thank you very much. Question number four, Willie Rennie. Jackson, Richard, Patrick, Nicola and myself, we all met yesterday. And we agreed we're going to keep on meeting and we're going to work together because this crisis demands that we work together. It, I got this letter, of, in fact, I've just, I've just opened it here in the chamber. It's from a constituent and the constituent says, right now, I am scared to death. After blood tests and a scan by my GP, my GP has said, I will be referred to a surgeon to save my life after the next test. But now the Scottish Government is saying that they are cancelling all non-urgent surgery for three months due to the COVID-19 virus. As you can see, I might not get the surgery I require to save my life. I would like to live a bit longer. Now, we know this is not the case, but people are worried about this and what it means for their own operations and their own treatment. So what can the First Minister tell my constituent? What reassurance can she give to people like my constituent and others across the country who are worried about life-saving treatment right now? Yeah. We need to be clear what we are doing so that these people are not afraid about their future. What can the First Minister tell us? First Minister. Well, let me try and um, set this out really clearly. And I would 
very much appreciate if uh, Willie Rennie could pass that letter and the details of his constituent on to us. Uh, what has been announced by the Health Secretary, and this is replicated in, in all nations of the UK, I think, uh, by now, is a, a decision that we, we have not taken lightly. It is unavoidable and essential to allow our NHS and particularly our critical care services to cope with what we know is coming down the track. But let me be clear what that was. It was the postponement of non-urgent elective procedures on our NHS. Urgent, emergency, life-saving, uh, cancer, maternity services, we want those to go ahead. So what Willie Rennie has outlined there, without me having seen all of the detail of that, sounds as if it is the kind of procedure that should not be being postponed, but going ahead. And I think it is really important that all of us take responsibly, as I know we do, and I appreciated uh, the meeting uh, with party leaders yesterday, which I am keen to continue. Uh, we all want to work together, but part of that working together is us being very clear in what is changing and what we are striving to ensure doesn't change and how we, we go about these things. Um, I, I don't want people to be scared. We are facing a really, really big challenge. Um, I don't want to scare people because in my experience, if you scare people, then it's not very productive. But I do want people to understand and to realise that this is not a drill. This is real. This is going to be happening. And we all have to take seriously our responsibility to follow the advice. So I'm going to take this opportunity now to do something else, which is just to remind people of the uh, advice that we are urging them, not asking them, urging them to follow for their own sake and for the sake of their loved ones and everybody else across Scotland. If you have symptoms, stay at home. If you're in a household with somebody with symptoms, stay at home. Uh, for all of us, cut down your social interaction. Um, and uh, that is particularly important if you're over 70, if you have a health condition that you get the flu vaccine for, if you're a pregnant woman. Uh, we've already said those with uh, the most vulnerable conditions, uh, compromised immune systems will get tailored advice. And I repeat, this is advice that is not and should not be seen as optional. This is about saving lives and that, you know, I've never had to stand up in the Chamber of this Parliament and say something so bluntly before. My job right now, uh, and it's not, it's not me that's doing it, I'm leading an effort that is enabling everybody else to do it, but it is just about saving lives, so we've all got to follow that advice for that purpose. <laughs> I appreciate the work of the First Minister and the clarity that she is providing and the professional way that she is going about this. And that's why it's really important that we flush out these issues so that people understand what actually is the case, so that people should not be afraid about their life and they do get the treatment that they urgently need. So there's little doubt that the UK government is going to need to do more to get money to put food on the table and keep the roofs over the head of our constituents. Using existing government tax and spend mechanisms is the best way to speedily get that money to them. The CBI is recommending reverse national insurance contributions. We also need to boost the social security system. These are probably the best ways to deliver some sort of citizen's income. Is that something that the First Minister is talking to the Prime Minister about? Does she agree that we need a statement from the Chancellor very quickly about this? Because people are worried exactly how they're going to survive, not just the virus, but actually have enough food and whether they can keep their house. First Minister. We are talking across the Scottish Government to the UK Government on all of these matters. Uh, I'm, I'm sure Willie Rennie and others will appreciate that uh, most of my interactions and the Health Secretary's interactions in the last couple of weeks have been on the immediate health emergency that we're facing but it is undoubtedly the case and Willie Rennie's right to raise this that the health emergency is fast becoming an economic emergency for for businesses for the economy as a whole and for households and individuals across the country and uh, I welcome uh, what the Chancellor outlined earlier this week I, I'll say something else that uh, I perhaps didn't expect to be standing up here and saying in this chamber I think the UK government like the Scottish government are trying really hard to do all the right things um, but they know and we know and we're talking about this there is much more that is going to be required and we will work together to try to do that we will do everything we can within our own powers and resources we've already set out a lot 
uh, of initiatives and there will be more to come from us but there undoubtedly needs to be more from the UK government who hold uh, most of the levers around this. I think moving through this uh, to some kind of universal citizen's income, basic income approach uh, is the right thing to seek to do and it may be absolutely the necessary thing to do. So we will continue to have these discussions because we cannot allow uh, this health emergency to uh, wreck the, the lives, livelihoods and incomes of uh, so many people. We, we all have to pull together. And I would also say it's really important that we do that in Scotland and across the UK, but this also requires a global uh, economic intervention as well. And I hope we will see uh, countries working together in that regard to beat the virus, but also to make sure that when we're on the other side of this virus, the rebuilding that will be required uh, is not as difficult as it would uh, be if we don't take the right action now. Thank you. As everyone will appreciate, there's a huge amount of interest from uh, across the chamber in asking supplementary questions. We're not going to be able to get through them all, but uh, hopefully members will be succinct. Alistair Allen to be followed by Paul McNeill. Can the First Minister confirm in more detail now what the arrangements will be for patients in Scotland's islands who require the use of an air ambulance and whether uh, that service is now uh, equipped and able to carry patients who have been tested positive for coronavirus? First Minister. Uh, yes, it is, and we will continue to make sure as uh, we develop our approach to coronavirus that we are particularly taking account of the needs of our rural, remote and island communities. Um, everybody is feeling anxious about this, but inevitably, in any uh, crisis situation, those that live on the, the, the margins of our country feel that anxiety even more acutely, so we will continue to make sure that that is at the forefront of our minds and our thinking. Polly McNeill to be followed by Miles Briggs. Does the First Minister agree that the private sector is essential in this dealing with the coronavirus already? There's a company in Glasgow who have identified hundreds of ventilators in China. I know her ministers are aware of this and Scottish Enterprise are working very closely. Um, I know probably don't need to ask this, but uh, for the record, does she agree that we need to do everything we can to make sure that they get all the assistance they can if this is a way to help in the coronavirus crisis? First Minister. Um, oh, I agree with that 100%. Um, I, I hope we know about the company Paul McNeill is talking about, but just in case we don't, I'd be grateful if she could pass on the details. Ivan McKee is chairing uh, a working group uh, involving officials from the Scottish Government, the National Manufacturing Institute for Scotland, Scottish Enterprise and the NHS, which is uh, coordinating efforts to mobilise the wider Scottish manufacturing base so that they can support NHS shortages for key manufactured products. Ventilators are very much at the top of that list of priority, but as I uh, referenced in my exchange with Richard Leonard, there will be other uh, products that fall into that category. So any company who feels that they have something to contribute uh, here, we've been inundated with offers from individuals and companies. Um, we've got you know, gin and whiskey distillers making uh, hand sanitizer. We've got avid offers of uh, timber if we need to build things, avid offers uh, right across the spectrum of everything you can imagine. People in the entertainment um, uh, and events industry offering their skills to help if, if hospitals need to reconfigure uh, their, their physical base. So there is so much goodwill out there and we need to harness it. Uh, I'm very keen that we in Scottish Government set up, and I've asked for some work to be done on this, uh, to make sure that there is a central point to collate all this so nobody's offers of kindness um, or help are falling uh, through the cracks. So anybody who's been contacted in that regard, please pass these things on to us. Miles Briggs, before by John Mason. First Minister, NHS professionals across Scotland are rightly being told to limit their use of public transport. A number of nurses have contacted me this morning who work at Edinburgh Royal Infirmary to say that they, that now pre presents a £7.50 daily parking charge at the hospital. Can I ask the First Minister what discussions the government have had with parking companies here in Edinburgh, Glasgow and also at Nine Wells in Dundee to suspend these parking charges while we are in this crisis? First Minister. Uh, I... Uh, I Sympathise with that. We have removed parking charges some time ago for all NHS uh, car parts. We have the PFI hospitals where that doesn't apply. Uh, the Health Secretary is uh, looking urgently at how we can get rid of parking charges during uh, this period from these hospitals. Uh, hopefully we can uh, talk to the companies to ask them to suspend them. Uh, but if not, uh, then the Scottish Government will want to look at what we can do to take away that cost from those uh, who will be working so hard to keep the rest of us safe in the, the weeks and months to come. John Mason to be followed by Ross Greer. Thank you. I think the First Minister is aware of the Lodging House Mission, which is based in my constituency and where there's been a winter night shelter since December, eh, also in conjunction with Glasgow City Mission. They are having to close 
uh, both daytime and uh, nighttime care. Uh, is the public sector able to take over some of this care that the third sector has provided for the homeless and rough sleepers? Uh, yes, uh, I know that Glasgow City Mission, who run the winter night shelter, took this decision for the sake of their guests' safety, and it is an understandable and appropriate decision. The Health and Social Care Partnership and the third sector and registered social landlord partners have made extra accommodation available to help rough sleepers and people in temporary accommodation to self-isolate. They're urgently looking at how they can increase uh, this capacity further in the days to come, including through the use of hotels and perhaps vacant student accommodation. Our uh, welfare and wellbeing uh, package, the £350 million package that Aileen Campbell outlined yesterday, uh, is all about ensuring that local partners can support people in need, uh, and that very much includes people experiencing homelessness. Ross Pears, be followed by Jackie Bailey. Thank you. I appreciate what the First Minister said about the testing of NHS staff, but three times in the last five days, NHS Lothian staff have received an email telling them if they display symptoms, you should stay at home for seven days from when your symptoms started. You will not be tested. From what the National Clinical Director told us yesterday, I'm aware that the new testing regime will be operationalised imminently. Could the Scottish Government please relay this information to NHS staff who are panicking about this and who are sending substantial volumes of correspondence to their MSPs because they simply don't know what to do? First Minister. Uh, yes, we will ensure that all NHS staff know exactly uh, what the, the testing uh, arrangements will be and how they access them. As I said earlier on, we are working at pace to make sure this is in place and that we have the capacity to process those tests. I would say uh, to Ross Greer, to, to the Chamber, but also to every single one of our health and social care uh, workforce, we know how valuable you are. We know how important you are. Uh, we want you to be safe and well. We don't want you to be at work if it is putting your own health at risk, but we want you to be at work if at all possible, because the rest of us need you, because you're going to be looking after uh, all of us. So we have a shared interest in making sure that this happens as quickly as possible, and that is our absolute priority. Jackie Bailey to be followed by Alec <laughs> The First Minister will be aware that those with existing mental health conditions, whether it's anxiety, depression, psychosis or paranoia, will have their conditions exacerbated by the circumstances of the pandemic. Will the First Minister therefore increase the resources and capacity of breathing space, which provides really valuable support? And what other plans does the First Minister have to take care of those with existing mental health conditions, as well as the well-being of the whole population? First Minister. Uh, the short answer to that is yes. If Breathing Space uh, wants to uh, contact us, we will look at how we support them. The funding that was announced yesterday, part of that funding is about making sure we can support organisations on the front line who are providing uh, crucial support. I've already referenced Age Scotland uh, that I visited yesterday. So uh, there we've already given additional funding to allow the expansion of that helpline. But other organisations, Breathing Space is a very good example of this, will have greater demand on their services. And as people um, are socially distancing as people are, are isolating themselves, these services become more important to make sure that those connections, those human connections that are so vital uh, to all of our lives uh, continue. So we are uh, very much wanting to do everything we can to make sure that those vital organisations have the support they need. Alec Neil, followed by Maurice Corey. Alec. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I draw the First Minister's attention to the statement made yesterday by the Prime Minister about a reliable test being available imminently to identify those who are immune from coronavirus and to ask if she's yet in a position to advise when such tests may be available in Scotland and who would be on the priority list for these tests, which would be extremely helpful in fighting this virus. First well, I've alluded uh, to this issue in some of my previous answers today. Um, and, and firstly, uh, notwithstanding what might happen in terms of new tests being made available, I've made very clear that key workers will be getting tested to make sure that they're not isolating unnecessarily and that we can keep that workforce as intact as possible. Uh, but as I have said already today, there are discussions ongoing about the possibility of new forms of tests rather than the swab tests that are used right now. Uh, dipstick tests that uh, can be used are quicker for people. They're not available right now, uh, but there are dis discussions taking place at a UK level with companies about whether there is the ability to make them available in the near future. And that, if it was possible, would allow people to test themselves much more quickly and crucially to uh, tell whether they had had the virus or not, to see whether they had the antibodies 
uh, that suggested that. I, I set out the three objectives of our testing arrangements, uh, protecting the vulnerable and saving lives, uh, key and critical workers and population surveillance so that we know what is happening with the spread of the virus. But that additional one, if these new tests become available uh, in enabling people to know whether they've had the virus or not, would be hugely important, particularly as we try to get uh, in the, the later part of this when we're trying to get uh, people back to normal. So these tests are not available right now, but I hope the work that's ongoing will see them become available as soon as possible. Maurice Corrie to be followed by Monica Lennon. <coughs> Pradhani, thank you. Um, can the First Minister commit to prioritising testing for frontline healthcare workers, ensuring that these are accessible at local level? First Minister. Uh, yes, I, I have been trying to do that repeatedly um, today. Uh, frontline healthcare workers are the priority in making sure that tests are available. We want to do that as easily and as accessibly uh, as possible, and that is exactly the work that is underway right now. So I'm grateful to Maurice Corrie for giving me the opportunity to reiterate that important point. Monica Lennon to be followed by Mark MacDonald. Thank you. The COVID-19 pandemic means that we'll need to look afresh at how we respond to Scotland's drug death emergency and give fresh... Um, consideration to the available capacity we have in Scotland's residential rehab centres and how we use them. There's many urgent questions about vulnerable people who are affected by substance use, but I agree with the First Minister, we do need a national um, collective endeavour. So can I ask that opposition spokespeople can have regular access to ministers because we all have ideas and ways that we can help and so we can work together to deal with these already big issues in our country that have become even more acute because of this outbreak. First Minister. Um, yes, I can give that assurance. I, I would hope that opposition spokespeople feel they have access to ministers. Uh, the Health Secretary tells me she's meeting with uh, opposition health spokespeople after uh, First Minister's questions. As Willie Rennie said, I uh, convened a meeting of party leaders yesterday and I've given an undertaking to, to meet with them regularly. Um, you know, I, we're in a, a period just now where, you know, we, all of us, myself included, it, it feels perhaps... Uh, a bit unusual because this is unusual times. Politics is normal, is not operating right now and it shouldn't be operating as normal right now. Um, this is the only thing that we should all be focused on. It's the only thing I'm focused on in making sure we do everything we can to get the country through this unprecedented, uh, enormous challenge. And government's got a leadership role here, but I'll be candid, government can't do it all on its own. Uh, we try to think of everything, but there will be some things we don't think of. So the questions that are raised in the chamber, the suggestions that are made, these are more important than ever. So uh, not just opposition spokespeople, but people, members across the chamber should feel that there are open doors in the government. If you've got ideas, suggestions you're hearing, if you think there's things we're not thinking of or not doing as well as we should, please tell us. It's in everybody's interest that you do so that we can make sure we're doing absolutely everything we can. Mark MacDonald to be followed by Richard Lyle. On the subject that government can't do it alone, I've been contacted by a small business in my constituency who provides specialist inspection and training services to the energy industry. Uh, over the last few weeks, their order books have ended up now with less than 5% of the pre-COVID-19 level. And next week, the owner tells me he will have no alternative but to close operations. Like an responsible business owner, he has business interruption insurance and has provided me with a copy of the policy. It turns out that the policy does provide cover for smallpox, which was globally eradicated before I was even born, but his insurance company tells him he is not covered for COVID-19. Last week, the First Minister told Andy Whiteman that discussions were ongoing with the insurance sector. Can she advise where those discussions are at? And does she agree that the insurance sector needs to get a shift on here because it could be the difference between companies surviving or not during this crisis? First Minister. Um, Yes, I, I would absolutely send that message to insurance companies. Fiona Hislop made a comment about the banks uh, the other day, which I absolutely endorse, and I would extend that to insurance companies. Uh, we need everybody to be playing their part and doing the right thing. Um, if Mark McDonald wants to pass the details of the company, we're very happy to look into that and to include that in discussions uh, with the insurance sector. We made uh, COVID-19 a notifiable disease quite some time ago, a few weeks ago now. That's important for insurance purposes. There's been also some debate, obviously, across the UK about uh, whether or not it is necessary for insurance purposes for uh, businesses in particular pubs, cafes, restaurants, to be ordered to close. Uh, and all of these things have been carefully worked through. The emergency legislation, which uh, will be published at Westminster, uh, new powers are being taken to try to deal with some of these things. But uh, you know, we shouldn't always be in a position of having to exercise legislative power. 
we're in a situation right now where everybody has an obligation to step up to the plate and do to the best of their ability the right thing, and that undoubtedly includes insurance companies. And Richard Lyle. Thank you, uh, President Officer. First Minister, there are unconfirmed reports that army units are setting up in Strathclyde Park in my constituency. What discussions have you had with the Armed Forces High Command in Scotland regarding this emergency, and will army units be used during it? First Minister. Well, the Army uh, is often uh, there to provide support uh, when we need it during previous terrorist incidents. For example, the Army, at the request of the police, have been able to provide uh, support, and there are well-established uh, procedures between the Scottish uh, Government and, and the Army in terms of dialogue. So uh, we will take help in this uh, wherever we can uh, get it, um, and you know, I'm well, happy to, to look into the specific issue that Richard uh, Lyle takes, but uh, we need to make sure that all resources that we have are appropriately, and I stress appropriately, but fully uh, deployed to make sure that our efforts against coronavirus are absolutely what the public need them to be. Thank you very much. And I'm conscious that there are quite a large number of members who didn't get a chance to ask a question. However, we've let the session run on already. So I'm going to close there and we'll resume at quarter to two for portfolio questions. I suspend this meeting. <laughs>